1 John chapter 2 and verse 6 says, Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did, or some versions say walk as Jesus walked. And in the spirit of this verse, our theme for 2023 is Christ made visible. If you were here with us last week, you know we kicked this off. If you weren't, that's why I'm doing it again. And the idea here is that the people that we come in contact with, that the spirit of Christ would be made visible to them as we live our daily lives. And so we are going to spend 2023, we started last week with the first one, but we're going to spend 2023 looking in the scriptures at the earthly life and ministry of Jesus, and we're going to use the Gospel of Mark as a framework for looking at Jesus' life. So with that in mind, if you can make your way in your Bibles over to Mark chapter 1, uh, that is where we are going to be this morning. You know, uh, several years ago, <clears throat> I saw a um, mini-series called Band of Brothers. Some of you may have seen it. Uh, but I share it because the tagline of this miniseries was, I have it up there, there was a time when the world asked ordinary men to do extraordinary things. And this miniseries had nothing to do with the ministry of Jesus. <laughs> uh, it was about easy company uh, in World War II. Um, but when I was studying this section this week of Jesus' ministry that we're going to cover this morning, I thought of this tagline, not of the world asking ordinary people to do extraordinary things, but Jesus asking ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And so we are going to go ahead and read here through our main text this morning, Mark 1, verse 16 to 20. Now here, if you were here last week, we tried this. I want to try it again. I was telling you a couple weeks ago, I was reading through Nehemiah 8, and when Ezra stood up and read the Torah, it says that the whole assembly stood as the word was being read. And so we're going to try that again. I'm going to ask if you are willing and physically able to stand as we have this section of Scripture read. Uh, Ali is going to graciously read through this for us. Um, I am coming from the ESV version this morning. I realize you may be in some others, but so you know, this morning Scriptures will be in the ESV. Ali, if you want to take it away. Okay. I was told to face this direction. <laughs> okay. In verse 16, it says, Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat, with the hired servants and followed him. Be seated. Thank you, Ali. Again, I don't know if we'll continue to do that, but I believe when they were doing that in Nehemiah 8, it was out of reverence for what God had to say. And that's our goal. It's not the standing up. It's our reverence before God when he speaks. But as Jesus starts his ministry here, he calls some very ordinary people. Acts 4 refers to these men as unschooled, ordinary men. They had a very ordinary, blue-collar job as fishermen. Jesus calls these ordinary people to a very special calling. And we know from the blending of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we know that this was not the first time that Simon and Andrew had met Jesus. In John chapter 1, before John the Baptist had been imprisoned, he had told Andrew, who was one of his disciples, that Jesus, as they saw Jesus, says, that's the Lamb of God. And so Andrew went and spent the day with Jesus. And he was so amazed after that day with Jesus, that he went and grabbed his brother Simon, who later became known as Peter, and said, you've got to come and see this guy. And then after, it was after John the Baptist was in prison that Jesus began preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. He called people to repent and believe the good news. We studied that last week. And then it was at that point that Jesus encounters Simon and Andrew again in the text we read this morning. But this time, he had a calling for them. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. The title of this morning's lesson is Answering Jesus's call. And as Ali just read, 
This calling had two aspects that we're going to look at because they are the same aspects for everyone that Jesus calls in any generation, including us. And those two aspects are follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Let's look at the first one. The first aspect here, the call to follow Jesus. You know, very simply in this section, we see Jesus say to them, follow me. And this was a continuous call in Jesus' ministry, not just one for the apostles. Yes, here in Mark 1, these four men ended up becoming apostles of Jesus, but consider these other examples of Jesus calling people to follow him. In Matthew chapter 8, we see one of the disciples say to Jesus, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Not someone who became an apostle, but he says, follow me. In Luke 9, he broadens it. He says to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The rich young ruler, of course, we know his story. If you know it, you know, man, he was called to sell his possessions. Well, yeah, Jesus did say that to him in Luke 18. One thing you still lack, sell all you have, distribute to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. In John 12, this, that wasn't just for Jews. In John 12, some Greeks want to see Jesus, and so the disciples bring them to him, and Jesus says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant also will be. We find that in John 12. And there are other examples in the Gospels. This is just a few, but it's clear that the call to follow Jesus was not just for apostles. Without question from the scriptures, we see that Jesus' expectation is not that we merely believe in him, although believing in him is necessary. It's not merely that we listen to him, although listening to him is absolutely necessary. It's not only that we speak to him, although through his grace we get to speak to him. It's not even that we just agree with him, although we need to agree with him. He is the Lord of the universe. No, it's that we follow him. Now, I don't know where each person is at this morning, but if you are not a follower of Jesus, or if you are not sure, or maybe I'm kind of on that journey, no, you are absolutely welcome here. We want you to learn from Jesus about following him. He's the one who says to me, come and take my yoke. A yoke was an idiom for my teachings. Come learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart. And with me, you will find rest for your souls. We want you to learn from him. We want you to become a follower of his. And we want to be able to help you in that process whatever way we can. We want to be able to communicate to you like Rich did this morning. That God is one who loves you deeply. And through his son, he has given the good news that no matter what we've done in life and our rebellion against him, Jesus paid the price for that on the cross and welcomes us to him. You know, in their culture, those who would have heard this calling right there in Mark 1, follow me, coming from a rabbi, meant become my disciple or become my student or apprentice. Apprentice might be the closest idea in our modern culture to understanding the end goal of this calling. Calling. In other words, following him, it's not like we might think of follow, like, oh, follow me, like, follow me on Instagram. No, that's not what he's talking about. It's not this uh, from a distance with a varying interest. Even when you think the call to be a student, it's not like, well, yeah, I'm a student over at CSU. I start my classes this week, meaning I go to class and I take some notes in order to get a decent grade. That's why I said apprentice might be better for us, because if someone is going to apprentice to an electrician, the goal isn't to just learn electricity, it's to become an electrician, right? And these men, they were Jewish, they knew this. This idea was ingrained in their upbringing. In Hebrew, a student of a rabbi was called a Talmud, or the pearl was Talmudin. And 
this idea ingrained in their culture, it was because it was the apex of the Jewish educational system. You have what was called the Beit Sefer. That was essentially a grade school. All the kids went there. You learned how to read, you learned how to write, you learned basic math. But also there, you would learn and memorize the Torah, the first five books of the Bible by the time you're age 12. Think about that. Just real quick, look at your Bible, go to uh, the first five books and go, man, memorize that by the time you're age 12. But that was everyone in that. Most were done after the grade school. Girls would start preparing for becoming a wife or a mom. Boys would start apprenticing under their dads to become a carpenter or a fisherman, whatever it is that their dad did. But the best of the boys only would go on to Beit Talmud which was a school that was built off to the side of the synagogue where young men ages 12 to 15 would learn from a full-time teacher and they would end up memorizing what we know as the entire Old Testament. But after that, almost everyone was done with the education. But the best of the best of the young men would go on to become a Talmud or Talmudim, a disciple or apprentice of a rabbi, which would be the apex of their education. It was very hard to attain. At this point, the best of the best would seek an interview with a rabbi who would then test their knowledge of the Torah, their knowledge of the Mishnah. And if the rabbi thought you had the knowledge, the skill, the ability to one day become a rabbi yourself, he would then say, come follow me, or come be my Talmud, my disciple. Can you see how different what Jesus did here in Mark 1 was? None of these men had made the cut in the educational system. That's why they were fishermen. They had apprenticed under their fathers who were fishermen. No rabbi called unschooled ordinary men to be their disciples. And yet here Jesus is calling them. They had not proven themselves to be worthy of being Jesus' disciple. In Luke's account of this section that we're studying this morning, Peter actually falls at Jesus' feet and says, Away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. I am not worthy to follow you. Later, Jesus rocks the boat even more when he has women be his disciples. Girls weren't even allowed to go past grade school. Jesus called ordinary people like them, and dare I say, like you and me, and calls us to an extraordinary task, being a disciple of the Son of the living God. Talk about a privilege and an honor. And their responses were told immediately, They follow him. In answering this call of Jesus to follow him, to become his disciple, they knew the level of commitment they were making to a degree. They knew what it meant in general to be a disciple of a rabbi. They didn't know all the details. They didn't know he was going to a cross yet. But the general commitment to being a disciple of a rabbi, they understood it. It would mean these three components. They knew first they were expecting to actually go be with Jesus. That's why they left their nets and they went to be with them. And for them, it was physically being with Jesus as their rabbi most of the time. I mean, read through the gospel. It's hard to find places where they're not together. For us, of course, Jesus is not in the flesh. But that's why we have the practices, the spiritual disciplines we've been talking about for the last year so that we can understand the life of living in the presence of Christ, keeping in step with his spirit who dwells in us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's cultivating a relationship of his spirit guiding every aspect of our lives, his word guiding our daily decisions. To be his disciple is to be with him. It is growing to understand that we can speak to him constantly beyond a scheduled time we might have to start our day. His spirit is literally with us 24-7. Secondly, they were accepting the call to become more like their rabbi, which for us would then be becoming more like Jesus. This was our theme last year because that's the working of... 
And it doesn't stop this year because that's the working of the spirit in our lives for all time till we die is to transform us to become more like him. Being a Talmud is not attending a class at CSU to learn enough information to pass an exam. We are with him in his word, led by his spirit in order to be transformed into his image. Following Jesus is not a class, it's not a religion, it is a lifestyle, which third, they understood this meant living how Jesus lived, accepting that call. Again, the passage we started with, that's kind of our theme passage for the year, whoever claims to live in him must live how Jesus lived, which is why this call had two components to it. The second call, the call to become fishers of men. You know, the second part of that call, when we see it in the text, one second, I got to wet my whistle. Follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Let me read that again. Follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. That's what they heard Jesus say. Fishing for men is not, ju- is not something someone who follows Jesus does it's something we become it is a part of our very identity in Christ and that's because it is very much a part of who Jesus was on earth and we're following him to become more like him and live like he did right consider these passages Luke 19 Jesus says he's interacting with Zacchaeus And he said, look, Zacchaeus, let's go to your house. Let's have a meal. And once they're there, Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house since he, Zacchaeus, also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. One of the reasons Jesus came to earth. Yeah, he goes, I came to reveal the Father. I came to testify to the truth, John 18. I came to seek and to save the lost. Those all intertwine. In Matthew 9, we see the heart of Jesus in this. It says that he went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We see Jesus teach and proclaim the gospel. We see him have compassion on the lostness of people. We see him bring healing to people's affliction. We see the heart of his love for people, but we also see his lament that there needed to be more laborers doing this. So he says to his disciples to pray for more laborers, for people who will live how he was living as fishers of men. If we're becoming more like him, we will become fishers of men. It's a part of our new identity in Christ. And then as Jesus' earthly ministry ends and he prepares to return to heaven, he leaves this final charge for his disciples, for those he had been making into fishers of men. Matthew 28, Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey all I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Go, make disciples, baptize them, teach them to obey what I have commanded you, everything I have. This is an extension of Jesus himself, his disciples now fulfilling Jesus' very mission on earth to seek and to save the lost. And then they were told to teach the very people they helped become disciples of Jesus to obey everything Jesus commanded, which obviously would have included fishing for men. At the end of Jesus' ministry, this all ties together. We can read through the Gospels. We can see how it ties together. It makes perfect sense. But when Jesus first called them in Mark 1, I wonder what they were thinking. 
I mean, in their culture, fisher of men was an, is a well-known idiom that meant to teach others, so they wouldn't have been totally clueless, but they were also unschooled, ordinary men. So it's not like they were skilled in doing this. And as I talk about us being fishers of men, I don't know, you may look at me and go, well, you're a minister, of course you, that's easy for you. You would be wrong. It is not easy. You know, when I was wrestling with the decision to answer the call of Jesus to follow him some 30 years ago, becoming a fisher of men, the idea of that was a stumbling block for me. I wanted to follow Jesus. I saw what he did on the cross. I knew I needed to follow Jesus. And I need, knew I needed his blood to cover the mess of my life. But the idea of teaching others about Jesus, much less actually helping them to become a disciple of Jesus, was overwhelming. Besides me having very little knowledge of the scriptures at the time, I was very shy and frankly just not very good with people in general. I think in many ways I'm still not great with people. The thought in my mind was, can I just follow Jesus and not become a fisher of men? Here's the scripture that convicted me and helped change my heart and mind toward that at the time. Luke chapter 9, verse 26, Jesus said, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. And the reason this helped change my heart and mind was for me to think of Jesus saying this, and try to take it into my life was, I had been introduced to Jesus. I knew at this point how awesome he was. I wanted to be with him. I wanted to walk with him. I wanted to follow him. And so I imagined that taking place in life, me and Jesus just walking, we're chilling, we're going, I don't know, we're at the mall or something. And man, am I enjoying fellowship with him. But then maybe I come to Foot Locker or something, and I see some of my friends in there. And I'm like, uh, Jesus, could you hang out here for a little bit? you know, because I didn't want them to see me with him. And then I go in. He hangs out there. I do whatever I do with my buddies, my friends there. I come back out, and I want to just pick up hanging with Jesus again like nothing happened. And when I visualized that, I said, how wrong to treat him that way, you know? Would I want him to treat me that way when heaven comes, you know? We're together. Now here's heaven. Oh, you know what? You want to wait outside for a little bit? You know? Of course not. Yes, I was shy. Yes, not very good with people in general. But was the real issue of my heart fear of what people would think of me? See, as a disciple of Jesus, there is no situation we enter where Jesus, Jesus should be left outside. Now, it doesn't mean we go into every situation going, Jesus, 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 Jesus. That's not what we're talking about here. But it does mean we express the love and character of Christ, Christ made visible through us. And we look for opportunities to share the gospel. So this scripture helped change my mind and my heart towards it. There was still the issue of, okay, how? <laughs> How do I do this? So I want to spend a little bit of time here talking about some of the obstacles or things that can maybe discourage us toward this idea. And the first one is the idea of skill. Maybe it's, well, I, I'm not gifted in this area. Well, neither were they in Mark 1. Unschooled, ordinary men. And remember when Jesus called him, he said, come follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. He knows we don't come to him already knowing how to do this. I'm a fisher of men. Can I join you, Jesus? For those with him in Mark 1, after they started following him, for the next five chapters, which chronologically covered several months, maybe even more than a year, 
we don't see them doing any fishing at all. They're just with Jesus, watching what Jesus is doing and learning from him. We're in Mark 6 before Jesus actually sends them to do some fishing for men. And even when he does that, he sends them in groups of two so that they would have support from each other. Then he has them come back and report to him how things went. And then he continues to teach and train them. Jesus is the one who helps ordinary people do extraordinary things. You know, the guy who originally reached out to me, he was struggling spiritually. I found that out later. He was having thoughts of leaving the Lord. His approach to me was awful. It was awful. But here's the thing. I was lost and needed Jesus. Jesus sought me. He found me through a very imperfect person. And through him introduced me to his mercy and compassion. We may be discouraged or feel obstacle is method. Like, okay, so what's the best method to actually reach people? Do we go to where people are? Do we try to bring people to where we are as Christians? Yes. Both. In the scriptures, we see Jesus approach some people, and in other situations, we see those people approach Jesus. In John 1, the disciples knew very, very little about Jesus at that point. But we see them find people they knew and simply invite them by, hey, come and see. Just come and see, you know? Even if we don't feel especially equipped, can we ask people to come and see what Jesus has done for us as we tell the story of the redeemed like Rich did? Can we tell people, just come and see this spiritual family that helps me walk with Jesus? I ask your participation here. I know you guys don't like to do this. Just simple show of hands on these questions. Who here, as a follower of Jesus, like you were initially reached out to by a stranger? what someone would consider like cold contact. Okay, look around real quick so you can see the number of hands there. Total stranger was the initial contact point for these people right here. All right, who here, who that kind of conduit that God used was like a friend or family member, like a close relationship? Look at the hands there. Hands there. All right. Who was it more like a casual relationship? So not a stranger, but like a coworker, a neighbor, a, a fellow student at school, that kind of stuff. So we've got a couple of those, got one in the back there. Okay, what does that tell you? They all work. <laughs> and God works through them all. So what does that mean? For me, that means I'm gonna offer some invites to a stranger. We've got some invitation cards over there. Never know when God's going to work through that, you know? Additionally, what's that mean? That means that, I, hey, we should befriend neighbors. We should befriend classmates. We should befriend coworkers. Be hospitable. Have people over for meals, for fun. Ask people questions about their lives. When you read through the gospel, Jesus asked a lot of questions of people. He let them talk. He found out what they were thinking and feeling. Also, I believe it means we should pray for and look for opportunities to share our lives in the gospel with close relationships, with friends and with family who do not know him. Now, this can bring up another discouragement or obstacle or question for us about motive. Is it disingenuous to befriend people in hopes of making them a disciple of Jesus? In short, no. But what if they think, oh, you just have an ulterior motive for befriending them, or your own conscience hits you on that? Hey, hoping someone becomes a disciple of Jesus for a disciple of Jesus is not an ulterior motive, it is the motive. It is. Now, not obviously, not everyone we come in contact with is lost. But according to Jesus, the likelihood is most are. He said, narrow is the road to life, and few will find it. Who did Jesus ever come in contact with and not care about their eternal destiny? 
Even those who Jesus was meeting a physical need in their lives, he went beyond it and tried to heal their soul. We just read Matthew 9. When Jesus saw the crowds of lost people, he had compassion and prayed that there would be a laborer in the harvest field who would love them and share the gospel. Will we be an answer to that prayer? You know, in Acts 17, Paul, as he's Holy Spirit speaking through him to the people at the Areopagus, he says, God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. God sets the times and places for people to live in order that they would seek him, in order that they could find him. And so if he crosses our paths with those people, will we open our mouths? Even if we don't know what to say, the guy that approached me was awful in his approach. But God had set the time and place and I was seeking him. And this person simply opened their mouth. You know, I almost titled this lesson this morning, The Silence of the Lambs. Because when Jesus' sheep are silent, what's the result? But I didn't want to be all negative, you know. And I know as his sheep, we're not going to be silent. Amen? Amen. So, but this helps me, again, this is, helps my mentality because then I ask, okay, why am I at this restaurant? You know, Cordell and I were having lunch this week, and total stranger, here, I can at least do this. I don't know if she's lost or not. God knows opportunity. Why am I in this class? Why am I at this job? Why do I live in this neighborhood? These are all prompts that help me remember part of my identity in Christ is I'm a fisher of men. That is why I am wherever here is at the moment. There's no situation in our lives that we should shut Jesus out of, no relationships that we should think we shouldn't bring Jesus into at the opportune time. And you know what? If people aren't receptive, don't write them off. Continue to love people to the degree they will allow it. Continue to pray for people. And should the day come that they are seeking, you're ready to help. Fourth obstacle or discouragement is maybe, okay then, but how do I share the actual, best share the actual gospel message with people. Once God has opened the door in someone's heart, which scriptures should I share? Maybe you feel like, oh, I've never really done that, or it's been a long time since I've done that, and I feel rusty. This is one area, honestly, that takes some practice. My experience, the best way is kind of on, it's not a job. I was going to say on the job experience, but it's not a job, but it's actually doing it. You know, one idea, we've, we've had a, a an outline or, or a, a help, a resource for people that we title, Come Follow Me. Um, I can make some more copies of that. I actually went to grab some to bring here today, and I'm like, oh, we're all out, you know? So I can get some more copies of that if you feel like a study guide that would help familiarize you with some scriptures to help guide someone through the core truths of the gospel of Jesus, that. But also, here's another thing, another show of hands here. Who in here feels confident in taking someone through the scriptures to introduce the gospel of Jesus, to help them become a follower of Jesus. Show of hands, who in here feels confident in doing that? Okay, again, look around. So now, everyone who has their hand up, if you don't feel equipped, ask any of those people to help you learn. Or ask them to join you when you have a friend to take the scriptures through. And then learn as you go through the scriptures with them. That's actually the way I learned. It wasn't in a classroom. It was getting together with someone who was capable of doing that, observing, watching them, and then learning. And that's how the disciples of Jesus learned. They went with Jesus as he ministered to others. Fifth, support. Don't try to do it alone. Jesus took the disciples with him, and even when he did send them out, he sent them out two by two. I mentioned that already. He told them that it's actually your love for one another that people will identify and see, oh, wow, those are disciples of Jesus. It's your love for one another that makes the gospel attractive, more than words on a page, but life being lived. I mean, even the way they fished would have been an indicator to them of the type of hard work required that required working together. 
They didn't fish with a rod and reel and a cooler of bud. <laughs> Away from the world where no one will talk to me. That's not how they fish. They fish with large nets with weights on the end. You know, in John 21, when it says Jesus gave them that large catch of fish, we're told that they caught 153 large fish. I'm not a fisherman. Fishermen, when you hear large fish, how big are we talking about? Weight-wise. What's that? Three or four pounds? Five. So if we have 153, 153 fish and they were five pounds each on average, that's a lot of weight. They weren't pulling it in themselves. They worked together to pull those weights in. Lastly, understand there will be times where there are no fish being caught. Don't grow weary, don't give up, persevere. In attempting to make disciples of Jesus, there's your part as a fisher of men, there's the part of the person you're reaching out to, and there's the part of God moving in their lives. You're only responsible for your part. Not their response, not the working of God in their lives. And even when it might not seem like God is working, we have no idea what is going on behind the scenes. There are countless people who have had a seed planted, and there's no evidence of it growing at all for weeks, for months, for years. Right, Mike and Devin? I talked to him before, they know where Mike's brother Rick was planting seeds, and from Rick's perspective, I don't know that anything's happening, but God was working. Amen. We sing that song, Waymaker, even when I don't see it, you're working. I realize I mixed my metaphors there. We're talking about fishing, I talked about seeds, so, but you get the point. And Jesus talks about seeds in Mark 4. We will get to that. Point is, don't lose heart. Keep fishing. Jesus calls us to follow him, and in doing this, he calls us to become fishers of men. I don't know where each person is at in regards to this today, but wherever you're at, will you answer his call? I want to reread the passage we read earlier in Matthew 9 as we close out. Speaking of Jesus, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So we're going to close this sermon with a prayer. So if you could bow your heads with me, we'll have a prayer through what Jesus talked about here in Matthew chapter 9. And when we're done with this prayer, the worship team will be up here and lead us in one final song for this gathering um, as we praise God. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for Jesus. Thank you uh, that you have looked at each one of us with compassion. That that is your heart, that you have proven your love through uh, cost, great cost to yourself of, of your son Jesus um, shedding his blood on a cross uh, to reconcile us to you. Uh, Father, we do pray for, pray that those who are harassed and helpless, that they would see that Jesus wants to bring them healing to their souls, that they would see that Jesus desires to shepherd them with this compassion he has. Uh, Father, we do pray that those who are followers of Jesus, that we would grow in our compassion. And Father, that we would be faithful laborers in the harvest field as fishers of men, as you continue to transform us to become more and more like your son, Jesus. Uh, Father, we're grateful that even though we are ordinary people, uh, we know that your spirit dwells within us. And we're grateful for that privilege. Uh, we're grateful that your spirit works in our lives. Uh, Father, we know that it's only through you uh, that you could do extraordinary things in our lives and in the lives of those around us. Uh, we pray that you would use your might to bring salvation in your kingdom. 
here on earth. We lift this all up in your son Jesus' name. Amen.